time to say a very good morning to Peter Hitchens. Peter, how are you? I'm reasonably well, thank you. Yourself? Yeah, very well indeed. Enjoyed your column yesterday, which was written without the benefit of knowing uh, that the Prime Minister has decided to lock himself away uh, for two weeks. I would have been very keen to see what you would have written about that. Well, not all that much. It's all part of this strange religion, which has so many people in its grip. And if you follow it, then then one of its beliefs has to be that if you're in contact with somebody who has, uh, who has later on contracted or is alleged to have contracted, is tested positive uh, for this mysterious disease, uh, you must then isolate yourself. That's the way it goes. Uh, there are all kinds of other peculiarities about it. And as I say, we have to treat it with respect among those who follow it, but the rest of us uh, look on in wonder. Yes, but I mean, the thing that struck me about Boris Johnson's statement was that he was making out that this um, act of his proves that uh, uh, the test and trace system works terribly well which I think is the complete opposite of what it proves. It proves how well, ridiculous it is. That depends what you think the purpose of the test and trace system is. I believe it's much like the muzzle decree, uh, which by compelling so many people to walk around with half their faces invisible, uh, p- creates a constant atmosphere of panic and worry that we are in the midst of a terrible scourge and the plague is about to get us. Mm. And the same goes for test and trace. What test and trace does is it discovers very large m- p- numbers of people who are not ill, uh, who nonetheless can be found to have traces of the uh, of the disease in their system. And we've had for the first time, I think, in human history, a global panic uh, about a disease which in many, many cases has no symptoms at all. Mm-hmm. And they have to be searched for. The governments of the world are having to go out and search for people who've got the disease uh, so they can get more worried about it. This is the absurd situation we're in, just as we're in the equally absurd situation of well, I'm absolutely sure our inflated statistics on the, the numbers of deaths really genuinely attributable to this disease. It is almost entirely a panic panic uh, created, as I say, by, by government action and by the unque- unquestioning repetition of government propaganda by far too much of the media, which people then trustingly accept because we are a society based on trust. And they can't conceive, I don't think, that the people in charge of government and the people in charge of organs like the BBC could be so dim. Uh, but there it is. They are. And it's time they learnt it. Well, you did say, I think, this weekend that it had, had, had the media that we now have been around when Watergate was happening, Watergate would never have been discovered. I uh, know. And Richard Nixon would have retired with honour uh, and would, 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 would never have had to resign. And many other things. Likewise, if in 2003 we had the media, the, 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 the supine media we have now, the fact that Saddam Hussein had no weapons of mass destruction would never have been found out. Uh, and all kinds of other very important criticisms of, uh, of governments would, would never have never have broken surface because so much of the media now is full of people who seem to want to, to actually suck up to political parties and government and go and work for political parties and government. Uh, the whole point of becoming a journalist when I started was that, as uh, H.L. Mencken rightly said, the proper relationship between newspapers and government was that between a dog and a lamppost. And we were there to make trouble, yeah. not, to, not to suck up to them. But this is all gone now. Now, if you actually make trouble, your fellow journalists turn on you like the, the victims of, in, in, in the invasion of body snatchers and point at you and scream. Yeah. I mean, I'm like you, Peter. I, I can't ever un- uh, understand anyone wanting to go and work for the government if you're supposed to be a proper journalist, because not only um, are you betraying what it is that you're meant to be, you're also then thinking of yourself as one of them. And what do you do when you finish doing that, when you come out of having worked for the government? You can't possibly really be- pretend to be a journalist anymore. I don't think you can. I don't think there is any return for it. But it used to be the case that people would go from journalism and, and, and be uh, poachers turned gamekeepers. But it was permanent. Once you'd gone, you'd gone. Yeah. And there was no going back. What happens now is that a lot of people while continuing ostensibly to be journalists, having their bylines in newspapers as if they were independent people, have already sold their souls to a political party or a faction uh, in the hope of becoming eventually a part of government. They think it's the thing to do and the thing to be. I, I understand this. Uh, governments are handy things to work for. They pay you regularly. They give you great big fat pensions. And you can tell people what to do. But it's not the same as working for newspapers or indeed uh, working properly for a a broadcast news organisation either. No, but it's incredibly difficult now to see or read or hear things um, which are not in some way slanted. 
you know, I mean, I'd like to think, I mean, I'm sure there would be people that would say that my my own views are slanted in one particular way or another, but that's fine. I don't pretend not to have views. But what I do say is that I take everybody at face value. I do the same work I would do uh, on Boris Johnson as I would do on Keir Starmer. I mean, it makes no difference to me. I don't vote as a matter of principle because I don't think I should. Because if I did vote for a party, I would then be affiliated in some way with what they stood for. And I've never yeah. done that. I, I, I agree with a lot of that. I mean, I, I resigned from the Labour Party back in the 1980s when I went to work as a political correspondent for the first time. I thought I really shouldn't belong to a party. Mm. Uh, nonetheless, I think it's, it was fairly clear during what I was doing afterwards would have been sympathetic to Labour for some time, though less and less so. Uh, what I do now, though, is, is, is I'm quite open. I'd say these are my opinions. Anyone can find them. I don't make any pretense to be unbiased or, or or as the people demand objective though i'm i try to be as insistent as i can both on checkable facts reference where you can and also on pursuing the normal rules of, of reason and making arguments so you, you if you disagree with me you, you know why you disagree with me you, you can aim off the wind as it were when you read what i say or listen to what i say but that's uh th th that seems to me to be fine what worries me is huge numbers of people pretending to be impartial and objective and appearing in newspapers and on broadcast channels while making this pretense, uh, and yet not being. And, and so people are fooled into thinking they, they, they're getting impartial information when, in fact, they're getting propaganda. Mm. And several things happened over the weekend. I noticed you commented on that situation up in Liverpool, which, which I think neither of us probably know the entire ins and outs of, of a guy who's apparently getting arrested for not moving along quickly enough. Now, I don't know if that's what he was getting arrested for, but it was certainly slightly worrying to see so many police officers apparently having to sort of uh, disarm one man who was unarmed. Well, I'm still waiting for, for information on exactly what happened. And I, I was careful not to come to any conclusions, except the one, which is that uh, there doesn't seem to be any shortage of police officers in mm. our country, despite this constant refrain. I went into this some years ago. We've got thousands more police than we used to have in the days when they did the job properly and patrolled on foot. Yeah. Uh, and this has always been a sort of trade union uh, lobby argument rather than an actual factual case. Uh, and they certainly had plenty for, for that event, whatever it was. But I, I still refrain from making any direct comment on it because I don't know what happened before or afterwards or indeed how it might have looked from another angle. Mm. One has to be careful with these things. Yeah. Like, the, the occasions on demonstrations recently, I, I won't go into them in detail. There's one in particular involving a woman who was uh, appeared to be being overthrown by the police, which, when examined, turned out to be not exactly as it appeared right. to be. Right. No, there's no question that there can be, uh, I mean, through the various prisms of social media, there can be conclusions drawn which should not be drawn. But no doubt it is a very weird time in which we live. I was over in Borough Market last week um, walking around. Like most of the, uh, the shops and, the, and the, uh, the, the, the food joints are open because they're selling food. Uh, some of it is uh, some of them are selling takeaway booze as well. Um, and the police are walking around uh, seeing loads and loads of people there looking at them, not doing anything. So there's a kind of double standard going on, surely. Well, I suppose, I mean, one, one should be glad that the police are not being too officious. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm I not think, unhappy I, about I, that. I, I think, I, let's, let's say for certain, a lot of police officers are sensible about this. Uh, and, of course, they don't get filmed being sensible. And uh, the, the, the remain in the police service, as we must now call it, quite a large number of men and women who are sane, reasonable, sensible, uh, measured, are trying to police by consent. But there's also quite a large number, whether it's a majority or a minority, I cannot tell, uh, who regard themselves as being in a state militia whose job it is to get their way by threats and force. And they're completely different from the police that I grew up with, and they don't seem to me to be performing the same function. No, quite. Now that we are sort of approaching the third week, I suppose, of this lockdown, um, there was some hope, uh, some who hoped that uh, if the, the rate that they talk about was re was reducing sufficiently, it might be that they might relax some of these lockdown rules. Um, but it seems as though that's less likely now. And we're now going to wait until Boris Johnson's finished his self-isolation uh, before we all emerge, you know, like butterflies from the from the uh, from the cocoon on December the 2nd. Well, the problem again is that uh, is that there remains this belief, actually, in the heads of quite a lot of people who criticise the shutdown, that there is there is some purpose in doing this thing. That there has ever been uh, any actual uh, proof that shutting down the country and strangling the economy and mucking up the NHS 
actually reduces or prevents the spread of the disease. Uh, I, I'm by no means sure that there is any proof of, of this, and I've yet to see any. Uh, and but as long as we continue, as I've said this from the start, to believe in this idea that you can actually control and suppress a virus by the actions of government, uh, then we're stuck with this forever. It's just that the last, last week's jubilation over the vaccination well, okay, I, maybe it'll it, it'll work, maybe it'll be fine. It seems a bit rapid to me. And if you look, as I was doing last night, the history of the, the polio vaccine mm. in this country, the United States, you can see there are many pitfalls in rushing into the implementation of, of a vaccine. However, well, it seems to work to start with. But leaving that aside, uh, I don't think that even the introduction of, of the vaccine, even if they successfully managed to distribute it, which this government is by no means guaranteed, even if all those things happen, I still don't think we're going to be out of it. Uh, because if, if the vaccine is successfully developed for this uh, particular disease, how long will it be before another disease emerges from some part of the world, which is used as the pretext for another of these shutdowns? If we're going to react to every virus in the, uh, that ever emerges in this way, then frankly, as an advanced industrial societies, we're doomed. We, can't, yeah. we will never get out of it. Uh, we have to recognize, and I keep on saying this, and you have to recognize now, we have to recognize during and after the public inquiry, this has all been a terrible mistake, which should never have happened, and it's not justified, and nothing about it is working. Well, just to, to help you out with a little bit of breaking news, apparently four other Conservative MPs uh, have now been ordered to self-isolate, having also been pinged from the same meeting that Lee Anderson had uh, with Boris Johnson. And you've been quite vocal before about the likes of Neil Ferguson and others who broke their own rules because clearly even they didn't believe them. I mean, what's the Prime Minister doing having meetings with groups of people when he's telling everybody else not to have meetings with groups of people? Well, presumably we'll have we'll have information about this when it comes as to how, how socially distanced they were and all the rest of it. I don't know. I, th I, I wouldn't want to prejudge without without information. And it doesn't. I, my problem with Neil Ferguson was that it was his own rules he was right. breaking. I couldn't really get particularly censorious because they were rules which I thought were ludicrous in the first place. <laughs> well, uh, that's true. That what, what, what he had done was evidence that he himself, uh, deep down inside, recognised that they were ludicrous too. Mm. So in, in a way, for one brief moment, one brief shining moment, uh, Professor Ferguson and I were allies in, in, in joining together to say, these rules are ludicrous. No sane person can take them seriously. And then off he went again on the BBC <laughs> saying they were sensible. And I stuck to my position. Yeah, well, he does keep popping up every now and again. with yeah, you, can't, you can't get rid of him. I mean, I mean, he keeps... Yeah, making... However many times he boobs, he and, still keeps Yeah, but, but, but I mean, a man, a more brazen character I don't think I've ever met in my life, because not only does he keep appearing, but he keeps making predictions which turn out not to be true. Well, there used to be an old saying in the Fleet Street of my youth, which was that nothing succeeds like failure, and I think it's <laughs> borne out many times in the... Well, we both work for many of those uh, those particular yeah. individuals, I think. But let's talk about uh, the economy, because um, uh, today in The Times, we see Rishi Sunak's looking at the possibility of people driving on the roads that they've worked for. Um, I dare say we're going to see a lot of manoeuvring from the Treasury over the next few years. Well, it's going to become more and more desperate. They, they keep avoiding the, the horrors of which many of us, of course, when this go wrong, uh, point two, which is actually accounts and how much money we don't have and how much... Uh, the, the, the quantities of, of debt are so colossal that no amount of taxation can set it right. Uh, though, on the other hand, there will be great pressure to claw as much back as possible. I foresee all kinds of things, quite possibly a, a, a supposed uh, capital levy, a raid on people's savings in their pension funds and in their homes will have to come about. Uh, they have to tax practically everything from breathing upwards to try and begin to get the money back, which they're spending now. And spending on what? Uh, spending on, on, on making us all bankrupt in the first place. The real problem is that after this is over, the tax base in this country will be so much smaller that those people who are paying tax will have to be squeezed even harder. Mm. And it will go on for decades so that everybody now in their 20s will be paying this off in their 50s. And also, and also will there not be a knock-on effect to the public sector? Because the public sector has grown beyond all measure uh, from when you and I first started out in this job. Um, and there's now hordes and hordes of people employed by the taxpayer, effectively. And if the tax base suddenly starts to diminish, then presumably so must the public sector. Well, this is the problem. I, again, in my final years, when I spent some time in the fi final stages of the Soviet Union, uh, it still had officially uh, quite a, a, an effective public health service. 
Uh, but in fact, if you ever went into, you, you, none of us ever dared to be treated in them, but if you ever went in to look at the, the hospitals of the Soviet health service in the, the, at the very end of the 19, of, of, the, of the 1980s and beginning of the 1990s, what you found was the buildings were there, but the terrible shortages of staff, shortages of things like uh, syringes, clean needles, antibiotics, anesthetics, uh, a lack of cleanliness, Although the thing still officially existed, uh, and, and no one had, had, had formally announced that it was over, uh, anybody who had either any sense or any money uh, didn't use it. And this, it seems to me, is a grave danger to the National Association. They can keep it going if they like, but if it isn't working, people will turn elsewhere who can. I've noticed around where I live, uh, private GP services are starting to pop up all yeah. over the place. Because people are, I mean, I'm quite lucky with my own GP service, but I hear of a lot of other people who are not. And people are getting sick of being made to stand around in car parks waiting for, for, for an offhand treatment. And they are going to, if they can afford it, turn to private GPs. So that uh, takes support, political support, as well as, uh, as well as morale, away from a service which also won't have any money. Except from the start, people, and people are still accusing me of caring more about money than lives. I said, you cannot separate the economy from life. If the economy doesn't flourish, you can't maintain decent health services you just can't do it if you're worried about life you have to worry about the economy yeah and also we spent a great deal of time last week on this show talking to people who had relatives in care homes uh, and in sheltered accommodation who hadn't seen them since march believe it or not uh, one particular woman janet from newcastle uh, whose, whose whose father was not terribly old not terribly infirm had all of his faculties when he went into the care home uh, but took his own life as a result of being isolated for such a long period of time, which they didn't know anything about. And it really is an absolute scandal, which is just one of the many scandals uh, that I don't think people are highlighting enough. No, and it was one of those which the brilliant Professor Sutri Bhakti at Mainz in Germany warned of from the very beginning. It was completely foreseeable. I think it's a, it's a, it's a lesson in any following any dogma. This, is, this whole COVID thing is a dogma. If your dogma leads you, a kind, decent, normal human being, to do hideous, inhuman, and cruel things, then the dogma is wrong. You should abandon it. Whenever anything leads you into doing things which you, which you can see from any instinct or moral feeling must be wrong, and the, the treatment of old people and the separation of the old from their, from their relatives has been indefensible, in my view, then the idea which lies behind it must be wrong, too. Well, exactly right. And you wonder when um, this government and Matt Hancock's been doing the rounds again this morning, doesn't seem to be moving from the, the mantra that he, that he continually spouts that we follow the rules, we must follow the rules, even though the rules are in sometimes incomprehensible and in sometimes just completely confusing and contradictory. There doesn't seem to be any sign that the government is, is taking account of any of these things that people are saying to them. Well, the government has a tiger by the tail. It can't let go. Uh, it's it's completely lashed itself to this policy. Uh, if it at any stage began to admit it'd been mistaken, then everything that it's done for the past six months, and that's a lot of things uh, that, is, that has damaged the country, damaged its people, uh, led to unnecessary deaths, non-COVID unnecessary deaths uh, in, on a large scale, uh, crashed the economy uh, and destroyed uh, huge numbers of livelihoods and the happiness of millions. If, if, they, if, if they admit it, that this has all been the mistake it has been, then then they are obviously uh, finished. They have to cling to it, and they will cling to it till the end. And that's I, one in a in a in my most generous moments, I feel sorry for them stuck there because sometime in the middle of the night it must come to them what they've done. Mm. Uh, but the only thing to do is to carry on criticizing them until they're driven from office and until they're so excoriated uh, by uh, by a public inquiry which says how how hopeless and useless and damaging they've been, that they retire for the rest of their lives to Trappist monasteries, having given all their goods to the poor. Mm. I mean, is there any chance... Which is the best you... fate I can think of for them. Yeah, absolutely right. Where they could join the other people who belong there, of course, are, are, are Blair and Alistair Campbell and all the people who got us into the Iraq war. And the, the Trappist monastery may be too good for that. Well, I found that one, one of the more uh, ironic episodes of the weekend was when Alistair Campbell was being interviewed by somebody uh, and declaring that uh, Dominic Cummings saw himself as more of a celebrity than an advisor <laughs> while giving the interview, uh, no, no, no less. I mean, quite remarkable. But, I mean, is there any chance... Alistair's self-knowledge is boundless, isn't it? <laughs> is there any chance 
that this kind of pantomime that we've been witnessing over the course of the last few days, you know, the parties, the, you know, Legra Stratton goes in, suddenly, you know, the vote leave people are kicked out. Suddenly we're supposed to be be believing that there might be a kinder, gentler administration about to emerge. No, I, I, I did read to my alarm that Dylan the dog might well have been expelled from Downing Street at one point, but apparently he's, he's, he's been saved. No, this is all nonsense. This is this is all um, special advisors dancing on the head of a pin stuff. Mm. It's not real politics. It's it's the soap opera to which political journalism has been reduced because so few political reporters are interested in politics, understand it or realize what's going on. Look at the amount of time devoted to this as opposed to the amount of time which should have been devoted to examining the government's policy properly. And you'll see what the priority of these people is. They're basically they're exalted gossip columnists, mm. uh, and, uh, and politics is show business for ugly people. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Peter, a good way to end this, uh, the conversation this week. Thank you very much indeed. We'll see you at the same time next week. Peter Hitchens uh, from the Mail on Sunday there. Uh, I think giving the lie uh, to the fact that this is in fact all real, that it's all happening, that it's going to change anything. I think he's absolutely right. I don't see a kinder, gentler Boris Johnson emerging uh, from this entire episode. He's now self-isolating for two weeks, as are now another four Tory MPs. So that's six people that we know of in this meeting. Let's hope there weren't any more than that, because that would be breaking the rules, wouldn't it? This is Talk Radio. Talk Radio.